this uh, time of transition where the Lord is bringing us into the fullness of what he desires for us uh, for the coming harvest, this end time revival that's going to last until he returns. I feel like it's very important that we have a very clear uh, picture, uh, you know, a, a, a vision of exactly what it is the Lord has called us to. I thank God for every church that preaches Christ and Him crucified. I thank God for every uh, every place where people can be uh, born again by hearing the the message of Christ and Him crucified. Thank God, even if that's a, if it, listen, if they never get baptized in the Holy Ghost, if they never get healed, if they never get delivered from demonic oppression, you know, still the number one thing is you must be born again. So I don't want to diminish what anybody else is doing. Thank God for everything, every healing. I thank God for the gifts of the Spirit in operation, that, that there are places where, uh, you know, healings break out and miracles happen. Well, that's because he is who he is. But see, God gave Dave a mandate from the very beginning to go far enough to take get a group of people and go far enough into God to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city that would then spread around the world. And included in that mandate, Dave found out over time, and he shared with us many times, is the works, it's really John 14, 12, where Jesus said, those that believe on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Well, He's not, he's not kidding about that. <laughs> if you look in the book of Acts, you see the same works continuing. In fact, you see some greater works. Uh, you know, we don't, I don't remember a time where, where they laid people uh, on cots in the, the shadow of Jesus as it passed by and they got healed, but they did with Peter. You know, amazing things. And, uh, but in the modern church today, and I want to be very specific, Thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God for people that teach healing, like just like we do. And thank God for every time that a miracle shows up or a healing shows up. And I'm saying that because by the gifts, anything can happen. But also by the gifts, anything cannot happen. What I mean is, uh, you know, we, we thank God for everybody that gets healed. But what about the ones that don't? I still remember all those years ago... Uh, the Lord blessed me to where I was able to go to South Korea six years in a row and get to preach there at a very wonderful church. And one of those years, uh, he blessed me where I got to go to Yanji Cho's church on Yoida Island. Uh, and I don't know if it still is, but at the time, it was the biggest church on planet Earth. And uh, just, I forget now, just hundred, you know, tens and tens of thousands of believers and a very beautiful building, very efficient place. I got to go about three in the afternoon. On, on Sundays, they have services all day long. And the service I attended, uh, Pastor Cho did not actually minister at that service, but he has many, many disciples that he's trained, and they're known for healing. Besides salvation, they're very famous that many healings happen there. So the way the Lord arranged it... Uh, I wound up, sit, they sit, set me down in the balcony, and uh, I didn't have a good view of the area where the wheelchair section is down on the first floor. And so as soon as they, as the usher left, the Holy Spirit nudged me, go sit over there. And so I, I moved, and where I could, where I, I sat, I could see right into the, what we would call the wheelchair section, where we, they bring those in wheelchairs. And the Lord had me pay really good attention. Now, the Lord was pleased. It was a wonderful service. They, I don't. It was in Korean. I didn't really know what they said, but I could tell kind of what was going on, you know. And during the during the service, and you could tell when there was an altar call and people stood and several people got saved. Just think if that happens every Sunday, all those years. I mean, think of the people that have been saved. Anyway. But then came time to pray for the sick, and they had people go down into the the section where the sick people had come and and uh, even in the wheelchair section in the I like I got an alert from the Holy Spirit and I pay close attention pay close attention 
Well, they went through there and with all the faith they had, and I was joining them with all the faith I have, you know, and we're doing our best and they're doing their best and the people want to be healed. And, and, uh, and, uh, and all I can talk about is that particular service where I, where I was, but in that service, there wasn't a single person got out of the wheelchair and there must've been, oh, I don't know, maybe between 10 and 20, maybe 15, something like that, people in wheelchairs. And in the, the service I was there, all of them got wheeled in, got wheeled out in the same in the same wheelchair. And the Lord said to me very clearly, just as clear as you're hearing my voice, I heard him. He said, that is not my will. Do not stop praying the mysteries. And if I've ever heard him, I heard him that day. Do not stop praying the mysteries because that is not my will. See, and I did, a, I did my research many years before by instruction of the Holy Ghost to go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John very carefully because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, I grew up in a church where if they did pray for the sick, they always added at the end of it, you know, we, we're praying for Uncle John or Brother Joe or whoever, and Lord, we pray that you heal him, but they always added, if it be thy will, because they didn't know. They thought, well, he might want to heal, he might not want to heal. He might want to heal, but not today. <laughs> you know? So I grew up with that, and so, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but it, my faith was limited because I got a watered-down version, if you want to know the truth of it, of the Word of God when it came to healing. I mean, they were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong <laughs> when it came to healing. So at the instruction of the Holy Ghost, many years prior to my Korea trip, I had already gone through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I mean meticulously. It took a while. Looked at every time that anybody came to Jesus for healing. And now don't get me wrong, he didn't, just because he walked through a town does not mean everybody in that town got healed. If they just stayed, if they didn't come to the meeting or if they didn't come to him, uh, they didn't get healed normally, okay? But right on the other hand, now here was my assignment, everyone that came to him. And I went through it meticulously. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every single person that ever came to Jesus to be healed got what they came for. Sometimes he had to pray for them more than once. Uh, sometimes he asked them to do certain things, like he put mud on that one guy's eyes and told him to go wash in a certain place. And, and uh, But it, the end result, every single one of them got what, what, they, what they came for. The closest you come to uh, is, it there, is it your will was the leper who came and said, I know you can, I'm paraphrasing, but basically he was saying, I know you can heal me and cleanse me if, if it's your will. In other words, if you want to. <laughs> if he, I know you can do it. See, and that's kind of the way I grew up. We know, they knew God could heal. They just didn't know if it was his will always to heal. Well, that was a, that was a leper. I know, you, I know you can heal me. I just, if it's your will. And the way it's worded, especially if you read it in the Amplified, it's like instantly. I mean, he was so eager. It's like he shot out his hand <laughs> and touched the leper, which really you weren't supposed to do, but he touched the leper and he said, I will. Whew. Boy, then Jesus says, if you've seen me, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, what does that tell you? It is the Father's will to heal. Now, Gary, does that mean every time you pray for someone, they get healed? No, <laughs> it does not. It should. It should when you pray too. The problem is never on God's end. It's on our end. That's why we're doing what we're doing, to seek the Lord, pray them. What did he tell me at Yonji Chose? Don't stop praying the mysteries. See, and right now it's a mystery to me why every single one that we pray for does not get healed when I know, I mean, I don't think you could beat it out of me with rifle butts. I know it is the Father's will to heal each and every single time. It's not him withholding his power. See, when, again, when the disciples tried to cast that, 
you could call it a lunatic or epileptic spirit maybe out of that boy and they couldn't do it but Jesus did it <laughs> later on they asked him why couldn't why didn't it happen when we prayed why why couldn't we cast it out and he he didn't mince words with them he said it's because of your unbelief it's because of your unbelief he didn't say it's because it's the biggest baddest nastiest devil that ever came down the road no that that had nothing to do with it in fact, he even mentions mustard seed faith against a mountain. Uh, it's not the size of the mountain, not how big the devil is. It's your faith. So he says, because of your unbelief, how be it this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. What does that mean? Praying the mysteries, fasting. Those things that the flesh never really likes to do. That's what Jesus said to do. Why? Because it deals with the unbelief. The problem was their unbelief. Prayer and fasting works on that. So that's why that's two of the pillars that we teach all the time. There's really seven, but we kind of reduce them to four. Everything to do with the Word, meditation of the Word, confession of the Word, obedience to the Word, um, prayer, which not only praying in tongues, but praying what you do know to pray in English or your known language, um, worship, especially the private kind where you spend time with God. More and more as I'm doing that, <laughs> that old adage is true, you know. You become like who you hang around the most. I'm finding out the more time that I spend with him in worship, <laughs> his love somehow during that time period gets poured into me. Uh, here recently, he's dealing with me about a certain lady politician that I will not name. That prior to my experience with the Lord, I wouldn't have walked across the street to spit on her if she's on fire. To me, she's just almost evil incarnate, you know. And <laughs> But anyway, after the Lord got through dealing with me, and, and it was amazing how he did it, but just spending time with him, he considers her. See, most of you have heard the story about one of my daughters really messed up when she was uh, 17 and wound up arrested by the FBI, and oh, it looked bad. It looked like she was going to go to prison for 12 years, and and I, I hated that, but it never affected my love for her, and all I really wanted was my daughter back. I wanted my, da my daughter back, not, not this one, <laughs> although it's the same person, but I wanted my daughter back. That's all I really wanted. God showed me about this, this politician, this lady politician that I was so angry with, and I still don't approve of what she's doing. But my heart was so wrong regarding her. He got it across to me. He feels about her the same way I felt about my daughter when she was in jail. He wants his daughter back. But he wants her back with a renewed mind and a changed heart. Same way I wanted my daughter back. And I went, oh my goodness. And it's, it's completely changed how I pray for that lady. And, and, for, and that affected how I pray for other politicians of the same Ilk, let's just say it that way. What I'm saying is you spend time with him, uh, you become like who you hang around. You know, you become like him. Okay. Now today's lesson, because I started it off saying without a vision, the people perish. We have got to make sure that our vision is strong. Why, why are we going through what we're going through? Why have we been targeted for destruction the way we have? Uh, it's because of the vision that we that God has given us. See, again, we thank God for every person that gets born again, every person that's healed, every person that gets filled with the Holy Ghost, every person that's delivered. We thank God for all of that. But that's just not what he's called us to. What he's called us to is where they, get, where they all get healed first time, every time, no exceptions. I call those, what we're contending for, I call those Jesus meetings because that's the way he did it. At his meetings, they all got what they came for first time, every time, no exceptions. There was never a case of, well, it's just not his will to heal you. You're not going to find that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's never a case of, well, he wants to heal you, but just all right, not right now, not today. You come back and let me see. You come back and... Um, in two or three months, and we'll check again. There's no such thing as that. 
if they came for healing, they got it. And they got it when they came. Now, so for today's lesson, and most of you probably heard me teach this before, but I, I just thought it would be good to have a refresher. We have got to keep our vision sharp. We, because without it, we will certainly perish. This, this is what we're contending for. Uh, let's call them Jesus meetings. Or probably the title of this message is going to be Jesus healed them all. And what I've done, I've gone through the book of Matthew and I stayed in, I could have gone to Mark or Luke or John, but I've stayed in a single book so that as I read these verses, really it's, I'm going to talk about these meetings, that when Jesus ran his own meetings, he healed them all. And I'm staying in a single book so you know I'm not, you know, because sometimes, you know, Mark will talk about the same meeting that Matthew talks about. So you'll know I'm not duplicating any meetings. These are all in Matthew. And you're going to see Jesus heal them all. Now that's the vision that we're contending for. Don't stop praying the mysteries, he said. Prayer center, don't stop praying the mysteries. I am absolutely convinced that only the Holy Spirit is, has got the knowledge and the wisdom to get us where we got to be. But he, can, he does have the wisdom to get us where we need to be. And it's, it's, it's the fulfillment of Matthew, excuse me, of John 14, 12. The works that I do shall you do also, and greater than these shall you do, because I go to the Father. Well, there it is. And I mean first time. And not just the five-fold ministry either. Because he has said again and again, this is, this is Joel's army. He's, gonna, he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Jesus said, those that believe in my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Well, that's you, believer. That's you. That's, so get your Bible out or get your iPhone, your iPad, your device, whatever you have with your Bible on it. Make reference of these somehow. Go back over these. Meditate these until you're there. <laughs> Where you can see what's going on here. Because these are the meetings that he's called us to. And these are the results that we're going to have. Because he has not changed. The book of Hebrews says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed at all. And it's still the Father's will being done. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, let's see Jesus. So I'm, I'm going to, let's see, how many have I got of these? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're going to look at seven different times in the book of Matthew where Jesus healed them all. Okay, so you can, we'll start in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 23 through 24. It says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people, not only in Israel, but from Syria, all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments that can include mental problems that can include demonic problems. And those which were possessed with devils, that's very specific. And those which were lunatic, now there's meant crazy. <laughs> and those that had the palsy. I mean, this is <laughs> very descriptive. And I love these next four words. Thank God for them. And he healed them. Them who? Them all. It just says, and he healed them. Now, all sick people, it did not matter what sickness they had. And all manner of diseases, it didn't matter what it was. It, it, from the least to the, to the worst that you can think of, it did not matter. And then specifically, talking about those that are possessed with devils, good Lord, those which were lunatic, every kind of mental thing you can think of, those which had the palsy, I would think that would certainly include cerebral palsy, like our friend Tommy Perez up in New York that I've, 
I've prayed for, Sue has prayed for, Aaron, her mother, dad, pastor, everybody. And we prayed, we milked, every, like Dave would say, we milked every fiber of our being for faith. We weren't, we weren't there. We didn't go there expecting him not to get healed. We expected him to get healed, but apparently not enough. Because the problem is never on, on God's side. God doesn't change. If you want to see God's will, you look at Jesus. Well, it says right here. Didn't matter how bad it was. Didn't matter if it was a devil problem or a mental problem. Didn't matter if it was palsy. What do you think? If Tommy would have been in that meeting, Tommy Perez, what do you think? Jesus would have healed him. Now, Jesus is in us. We know we've been teaching so much about we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God, not of us. Well, Christ in us. That's, that is the gospel, Christ in us. I was thinking today, you know, I'm, Jesus, the man, was God with us. <laughs> Inside the man was God. <laughs> God was with us. Now, don't get me wrong, Jesus, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's another topic. But while Jesus was had his own physical body, God God had that body. And God was with us, and God worked through that body to do the... That's the Father doing the works. Jesus said, it's not even him doing it. He said, it's the Father in me doing the works. Well, God was inhabiting a human body and doing the works. You know what? Christ is inhabiting our human bodies, and the Father in him is still doing the works. The ministry of Jesus was never supposed to end this supernatural ministry was never supposed to end at the when he ascended into heaven it was supposed to be multiplied i like how alan says you know the devil couldn't even handle one jesus what he means by that is one human on earth with the power of god working through him what if he had a million what if there was up against you know what if we believers were believing <laughs> boy there's a title believers that believe <laughs> But what if we were believing like we're supposed to be believing? Because Jesus said, those that believe on me, they're going to do the same works. Why? Because it's Christ in us, and it's the Father in him. And he said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. <laughs> he says, I want to be believed. Believe it. Well, don't stop praying the mysteries. Don't stop. But anyway, can you see so clear there? Not only in Israel, they brought them from Syria. And it didn't matter how bad it was, see? It didn't matter whether it was a devil. It didn't matter. They specifically mentioned sickness, all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. Then it talks about torments. I don't know exactly what that is. Those that were possessed with devils. Okay, it didn't matter if it was a devil. Those which were lunatic. didn't matter if it was a mental thing. And those that had the palsy, like cerebral palsy today, that they really have no, really no cure for except Jesus. <laughs> See, Jesus does not believe because the Father does not believe in impossible cases. Doesn't believe in that. I don't believe in it either. Okay, so that was Matthew 4, verses 23 and 24. Let's look at another one. Go over, go over to Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. It says, When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, now notice, and healed all that were sick. How many? <laughs> all. Jesus healed them all then. He hasn't changed. If we can believe, he'll heal them all now, but he'll do it through us that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. That's referencing all the way back to Isaiah, and I didn't look up the reference. but See, I like it when the Bible is its own commentary. If you read the commentaries back there in Isaiah about what people say about that, it, I, some of them just flat say, well, it's not talking about sickness and disease. It's talking about sin. Well, it, he did take our sin too, by the way. But I love it when the Bible is its own commentary. And here it plainly tells you that it was talking about sickness back there. Because he took, okay, let's read it again. 
they brought unto him those that possessed with that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Then he says that it might be fulfilled. In other words, this was the fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah said way back there. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. He'll do the same today. And it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't say, well, now it's not a sickness, it's a devil. It doesn't matter. You notice they brought those possessed with devils and he healed the sick. It doesn't matter what's causing it. Jesus is above all. Jesus is Lord of all. He healed them all then. He'll heal them all now. He's just doing it through our bodies because we are the body of Christ. You know, we've taught on this many times. This body, the reason he had to leave us in these is so you can live on planet Earth. You know, it's your, basically your Earth suit. In the same way that you can't live in space without a space suit, you can't live on planet Earth without an Earth suit. If you don't have a body from this Earth, you can't live here. And you don't have authority here. That's why we're new creatures. We're from another world, but our bodies are still from this world, so we can live here. It's our earth suit. And it has all kinds of desires and, and uh, appetites and things that don't line up with God. So we, that's why we have to mortify, we, the real us from another world, we have to mortify, put to death, the deeds of the body. My body would still smoke if I let it. It'll still drink if I let it. It'll still watch pornography if I let it. It'll, it'll just do all kinds of things if I let it. My job is not to let it. <laughs> That's called mortif mortifying the deeds of the body. And you'll find your body can be trained. There was a time when I was quitting smoking. <laughs> when my I thought I was going to die. My body kept telling me, you give me a cigarette or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Boy, the withdrawals were so bad. And during that time period, which was about a year and a half, to be honest with you, for me, during that time period, boy, if somebody walked by and they were smoking, I wanted to follow them. To me, that smoke just smells so good because I'd trained my body to want it. And at that time, it was really appealing. Now, go two decades past there where I haven't smoked now, and the smell of smoke is the most horrible thing. <laughs> I can't believe I ever smoked. I can't believe I ever liked it. My body does not crave nicotine anymore, thank God. So I've learned you can train the body. But I could train it again in the wrong way. If I decided to, I could start puffing on them again. It wouldn't be very long. My body's going to be addicted. It's going to want it again. See, so it's up to us. We are the creatures from another world. You know, it's like a science fiction movie. The creatures from another world. Well, that's Christians. Heaven is our world. Heaven is our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> and uh, we, we have invaded these bodies. And, you know, I like to say, well, it's like camouflage. You know, that unbeliever over there, he sees you walking up. He thinks you're just another normal human like him. He doesn't know you're an alien from another world. <laughs> and really you are as a Christian. You're an alien from another world. But you're living in a body from this world. But that's why we have to mortify the deeds of the body. I can't let my body do what it would like. Anyway, even when it comes to Krispy Kreme donuts, I mean, if I, <laughs> and I haven't had any in, gosh, a year, I don't know, a long time. But if I let my body eat all the donuts it wants to eat, I'd be so big I couldn't walk through the door. Come on. Can't do that. Can have one every, every few months. <laughs> okay, back to this. Let's go look at another one. How about Matthew chapter 12? Just one verse. Matthew 12 and verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there. Excuse me. From thence. He withdrew himself from thence. And great multitudes followed him. And he healed them all. When it says great multitudes, let's meditate. When it says great multitudes, don't be thinking a hundred people. You know, he, f he fed the, the multitudes. Remember the loaves and fishes? One time was it 5,000 men? Another time it was even a larger number, I think. Well, if you count women and the children that were there, that's multitudes, you know. 
And here it doesn't just say multitudes. It says great multitudes. There, there's no telling how many thousand people were, were following him on this. Thousands. How long was that prayer line? <laughs> I don't have any idea. And it, then it says, and he healed them all. Oh, don't you love those words? He healed them all. It takes all the guesswork out of it. You don't have to put that faith-killing sentence at the end of it, if it be thy will. It's his will. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if time and time again, let's go see the Father. Let's go see what the Father's like. We've learned that if we watch Jesus and we see what he does, then we'll know what the Father's like and what his will is. So let's go watch. And you go to a meeting. My goodness, he healed them all. Then he goes, he has another meeting next week, and you go to that one. And maybe there's even more people, and, and devil-possessed people, and mental problems, and everything in the world. Sometimes it says uh, the maimed were made whole. So they're carrying in people that's missing a leg, missing an arm, missing an eye, missing something. And he heals them all again. And it even says the, sometimes the maimed were made whole while they watched. Oh, my goodness. He did it again. Now, he said, if we've seen him, we've seen the Father, we've been to two meetings, and he healed them all and cast out all the devils, it, I'm beginning to think it might be the Father's will to heal them all the time. <laughs> all of them. See? And we've only come to three. We've only mentioned three. We're going to do, what would I say, seven? We're going, to, there's, we're going to look at seven of them today. How many, how many do we need to come to the conclusion? It's the Father's will. And it's always the Father's will. It's never not the Father's will. See, I've already done the homework. You can, you're welcome to do it too, but you're going to find the same result. You'll never find a case where Jesus said it's not the Father's will to heal you. Or it's not his will to heal you today. You're never going to find it. Because it didn't happen. He, just like here, he healed them all. And if you went to meeting after meeting after meeting, and you see every time, every time, every time, anybody who came for healing, he healed them all. Aren't you going to be convinced after a while? Gee. <laughs> he said, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. I, I have to conclude. It's always the Father's will to heal them all. If they come for healing, it's the Father's will to heal them. What are you going to do with that? You're going to believe it. That's what you're going to do with that. We're all going to believe it and do the works because that's what Jesus said we're going to do. All right, here's another one. Go to uh, Matthew 14. Again, just one verse, verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. Now, this is a different multitude. We're still in the book of Matthew. We're two chapters over from where we were before. So he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Well, if words, how many sick? If words mean anything, all their sick. He healed their sick. If you were sick there in that multitude, you got healed because he healed the sick. They're sick. <laughs> I don't mean to keep, <laughs> I get excited and I get close. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> but I, I get excited. He healed their sick. How simple, but how profound. Great multitude, it says. A great multitude. 5,000? 8,000? 10,000? You know, I've been in the Civic Center here in, in, in Tulsa even. Back in the 80s, where they'd have 21,000 people to attend a, a religious service. There's no telling how many people. No telling how many sick people. See, see, if Jesus would have been... Boy. And he was there. Don't get me wrong. But I just, I just saw if Jesus was the one. I, I saw that just in my mind real quick. I saw a flash. I'm back on Yoida Island in South Korea. Back in that church of Yonji Cho's. And I'm not just in a flash... Instead of seeing those people walk among the wheelchairs praying, just in a flash, I saw Jesus in a white robe walking through those wheelchairs praying. And every, every single one of them, as he would pray, 
every one of them would get up and walk off. Every, some of them dancing and jumping. See, well, it's just Jesus in us. It's Christ in us. That's not going to change. That's the method God has chosen. Christ in us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, but we really have it. We really have this treasure. Christ in us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, it has everything to do with maturity. I hope you're remembering all of the classes, all of the teachings we've had in the last year on maturity and fruit and 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 even though and spe those that Alan Taylor have been teaching about bearing fruit and maturity. Christ, Jesus said the sower sows the word, but if it comes in like a seed. It might be the smallest seed in the garden, like a seed of mustard seed. But see, in that in that seed is the image of the full grown plant, and in the seed of Christ is the full grown full grown Christ. If we'll focus on those things that come to, that bring us to maturity and allow that new man to grow up, the one that's made in the image of Christ, allow that to grow to maturity. Listen, you don't have to force mature fruit trees to bear fruit. They just bear fruit. That's, that's just what they do. I, like, I love how Dave would say it. He said, you know, <laughs> it's not hard to love when love is what you are. You think it's hard for an apple tree to produce apples? You think it's hard for an orange tree to produce oranges? The only hard part was growing to maturity and not being choked out by weeds or uh, storms or circumstances so that the tree never comes to maturity. See, and that's what Jesus was teaching in Mark chapter 4. Usually what happens, the storms of life, how did he put it? He said persecutions, afflictions, the cares of this world, uh, you know, the, the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things. They choke the word. How do they do it? They distract you. Taking you away from time with him. Taking you away from those things that bring maturity. Because trust me, there'll never be fruit without maturity. It's just, there's no such thing as a fruit tree producing good fruit. Now you they might produce a little, I told you about the peach tree, I think, last week. You know, that little bitty peach tree that was, I, I, I tried to eat one. It was so bitter, I had to spit it out. But there wasn't anything wrong with the peach tree. It's a perfectly good peach tree. Nothing wrong with it at all. I said, well, how come it's producing bitter fruit? Well, it hasn't come to maturity yet. You, you, come, back a, you come back a few years. Give that, give that tree time to grow, time to mature. And that same tree, without effort, without strain, will produce sweet peaches because that's what it is. Whew. Remember how Dave would teach about the husband that was trying to love his wife more? <laughs> he went to a counseling session. We said, well, you, you, you got to do things. So he, he'd get up early and make her favorite breakfast and bring it to her in bed. You remember all that? And, and, uh, <laughs> and it, it, oh, it was great, and at first she loved it, and he'd bring a little rose on the tray, you know, and mmm, I love you, sweetie, and here's your favorite pancakes and syrup and bacon and whatever she liked, you know. And it went well for a little while, but then one day he brings it up, and she goes, don't we have anything in this house but pancakes? And boy, the deal's on again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there are, because they're trying to love. But Dave says, and, you know, there's some benefit to that, but he said, do you know it's not hard to love when love is what you are? And that's just Dave's way of saying it, if we'll grow up. See, what is the fruit of the Spirit besides the miracles and the healings? How can you tell you got a mature tree here? Well, because it's going to produce love, joy, peace, goodness, long-suffering, temperance, faithfulness. It's going to produce all of the things that you read about in Galatians chapter 5 because that is the fruit of the Spirit. And the, if, if you come to maturity, it's just who you are. You don't, have to, you don't have to be those things. You just are those things. Whew. Makes me want to go pray. See, and that's why we keep focusing so much on the things that come that will bring us to maturity. And that's part of this vision. That's part of why I'm making this particular uh, message today. We've got to have a clear vision. Nowhere on planet Earth today, either a medical 
or um, in a ministry, religious sense. There's nowhere on planet Earth. I want to pick on my friend Homer Betancourt, who's blind right now. Well, not for long. <laughs> There's nowhere on planet Earth, a hospital or a church, where I can take my friend Homer and know for sure that when I come back with Homer, he's going to be seeing. But see, if I could get Homer, if, if we were alive in the day when Jesus was on the earth and I could get him into a Jesus meeting, what do you think? If I get him in the presence of Jesus, well, he healed them all then. Wouldn't he heal them all now? Sure he would. I'd be bringing Homer home healed. That's exactly what God wants. And he wants us to demonstrate it to the whole world. The, we're, going, we're going to have, God's going to have his revival. You're going to be part of it. We're already in the edge waters of it, I think. And there's a lot of resistance to it. But see, the world is tired of hearing the church's words without power. They don't believe us anymore. You know, Jesus in John 14 said, well, believe me or believe me for just for the work's sake. In other words, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at, look at the injuries. Look at the pudding. Well, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, <laughs> the truth is in the pudding. You know, the eating of it. He says the proof is, yeah, the proof is in the pudding. Well, he's saying, just, well, look at the works. When I tell you it's God in me, no man can do these things. It's the Father in me. He's doing the works. You can either believe me or just look at the works. But see, the church can't really demonstrate that today like he did. And the world is tired of hearing our words without power. Shut up or shut up. Well, it's, we're not going to shut up, but we're going to put up. We're going to show the world it, it's time. Again, i got to say it. We are living in another Mount Carmel time. Thank God for Elijah. See, you're an Elijah. You just don't know it yet. You're in an Elijah generation because it's Mount Carmel time. The whole world is really running after other gods. And Elijah stood up in his generation because Israel was running after other gods, especially Baal, but other ones too. And he says, listen, if Baal be God, serve him. But if Yahweh be God, serve him. The God who answers by fire. He is God. And boy, he flat brought him to a showdown. And you know the story, they prepared the bull and everything and the, there was, what, 450 prophets of Baal, and they, they called on their God all day long to send fire, and nothing happened. They cut themselves with stones, and Elijah started making fun of them. Well, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe, maybe he's not listening today or something, you know, just he's making fun of them. Finally, it came his turn. And not only did they have the bull on the wood, he said, bring water. And they doused the bull, they doused the wood. They they put a, a they dug a trench and filled it with water around it. And when Elijah called upon the true God, it's just the church now. We call upon the true God. Boy, the fire fell. It said it consumed the bull. It consumed the wood. It consumed the rocks. It licked up all the water and the people. See, suddenly it wasn't just Elijah's words. They saw something. They saw power, and they said, oh, uh, Yahweh, he is God. <laughs> he is God. And they even killed the 450 false prophets. Now, I'm not recommending we kill anybody, but we need to put to death this worship and obedience to false gods in this nation and around the world. There's only one God. It's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and He is it. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And you'll either come to the Father by Him or you won't come at all because He is the only way. He is the truth and He is the life. You must be born again. Oh, Malachi, Listen, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, even before the end of this message, just do it right now. Let me, let me help you. Just say this after me. Father, I'm a sinner. Father, I know that you sent your son 
to shed his blood as a substitute for me. I believe you, Father. I confess my sins. I, I Please forgive me. I repent, Lord. Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. I believe that you've been raised from the dead. Come, come, Lord. I open the door. Come in and be my Lord. Come in. Come in, Lord. Receive, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior into my heart. And then fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Boy, if you do that, it'll be the best decision you ever made in your life. Best decision ever. Your whole world will change and your whole eternity will change too. Let me check the time. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. Going over to Matthew chapter 15. This one's a little longer. Not too long though. Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 30 and 31. Here we go again with great multitudes. Don't be picturing a couple of hundred people. Thousands of people. So great multitudes came unto him, having with them that were them that, oh, look, watch this. Having with them those that were lame, blind, dumbed, meaning they can't speak, maimed, they're missing a part, and many others, everything you can imagine, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. What did he do? And he healed them. Oh, don't you love those four words? And he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw it. I mean, this happened while they watched because they saw it. When they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole. Meditate on that one. Think on that one for a minute. The maimed were made whole while they watched. Now that means they brought in somebody either with a birth defect or by, ac or by some accident. They're missing a leg, missing an arm, missing an ear, missing an eye. They're maimed. Something is missing. And they bring them and they lay them at Jesus' feet. He prays for them. And while the great multitudes watch, can you imagine today we'd had ABC, NBC, CBS, and the Fox News Network, and they've all got their cameras trained right, right on the service because they're trying to disprove all this. And with their cameras trained on this person that came in with no leg in front of the whole world, they just watch. We all watch on, on our TVs or on the Internet as that leg just grows out. And it's not some kind of CGI, computer-generated thing. No. The leg really grows out. Now see, that's what the world needs. Believe me for the work's sake, he said. Believe me for the work's sake. We need to show these kind of works to the world. Believe me for the work's sake. So he said, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk. See, that's what I wanted to see at Yonji Cho's church. They had like roughly 15 wheelchair cases and not one of them walked. Now, I've seen them walk. I've seen, I've seen Dave lay hands on them and see them walk. But see, I've seen other times when Dave would lay hands on them and they didn't walk. See, that's the gifts in operation. We thank God for it. We're to covet the best gifts. Thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. But Jesus did it a little. He did it from a position of full maturity. Basically, he was saying, what, what do you want from the Father? Everything the Father has is available. I'm here to serve you off of his table. He asked the blind man, blind man one time, what, what, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, well, that I could receive my sight. Well, okay. Wow. And it wasn't like, gee, I hope the gifts are in operation today. They were always in operation with Jesus. Why? He was full grown. He was mature. So the lame to walk, oh, Homer, the blind to see. We're going to have Jesus meetings. Not only is Homer going to see, Homer is going to lay hands on the blind and they're going to see. <laughs> Isn't that right, Homer? Yeah, I heard that. Yes, amen, brother. Amen, brother. <laughs> and they glorified the God of Israel. See, right there in John 14 again, he said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. 
Surely I tell you, whatever you ask in my name will do it. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. God gets all the glory. This is all about glorifying him. You know, it was a long time before it dawned on me. You know, I know Jesus is the king of the kingdom. But you, remember how he taught us to pray, though? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Jesus instructed us to, when we pray to the Father, to say to the Father, Father, thy kingdom come. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. But if you read all the way through the end of the book, you're going to find out at the culmination of all things, when everything is done, Jesus is going to present the kingdom back to the Father. Because it's his kingdom. <laughs> My feet are wanting to take off. I'm telling you, <laughs> the gospel is the best thing ever. <laughs> anyway, the blind to see and they glorified the God of Israel. I'm telling you, God... The glory of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. This revival is going to spread the glory of God. People are going, it's going to be undeniable. What are you going to do? What are you what are you going to do, unbeliever? When the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the maimed are made whole. And there's no denying it's just a little Mary wallpaper and Joe Public. Wasn't anybody of you know, uh, 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 fame and fortune and rich and renowned? No, it was a little Mary wallpaper. Third row, Mary Wallpaper. <laughs> Hardly anybody knows her name. She lays hands on the sick and they recover. She opens the eyes of the blind because whatever she asks in his name, he does it. Good God, Eric, my feet are wanting to go again. <laughs> Boy. All right, let's go over to Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. And verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass... That when Jesus had finished these things, he departed from Galilee, and he came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. Here we go again. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. He healed them there. Great multitudes. And he healed them. Healed them who? Healed them all, or it would have, it would have said. He healed them. Uh -oh. He healed them. He hasn't changed. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father hasn't changed. Okay, our last one. Let me check my time again. I have to kind of strain. Okay, we're doing pretty good. Matthew 21, verses 12 through 14. And Jesus, oh, no, this one. And Jesus went into the temple of God. And cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. And he overthrew the tables of the money changers. And the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him, now notice, in the temple, and he healed them. This one has special significance for me personally because early on, way back when Sue and I were first hearing these messages by Pastor Dave Roberson, and he kept talking about praying the mysteries and how important it was and what all the Holy Spirit would do to help you uh, if you just spend time allowing him to pray the mysteries through you. And most of you know, uh, God had me in the perfect job for a middle-aged man who doesn't have time to waste and basically needs to get paid to pray. He had me in a long-haul trucking job at the time. And I'm stuck in the cab of that truck 40, 50, 60 hours a week anyway. And all I really had to do was just turn the radio off, turn the CB radio off, and just discipline myself to begin to pray. And at first, it took a while. <laughs> but you know, to this day, now I am so, I'm like Pavlov's dog, you know, ring the bell, salivate. I touch the steering wheel, I pray in tongues. <laughs> I just can't help it. it. You know, I got trained to do it. But at first, it was difficult. And my mind would drift and I'd realize I, I wasn't praying anymore. Well, all you can do is say, oops, sorry, Lord, I'm going to start again. And so I remember that first uh 
10-hour shift in those days. I don't know what it is now, but in those days, you drove 10 hours and took eight hours off. And then you drove 10 hours and you took eight hours off. So I'm, I was, uh, I, I remember praying that first 10 hours. And, and uh, boy, it seemed like forever. I don't know how many times my mind drifted and I quit praying and I have to bring it back again and start again. And, uh, any, and uh, anyway, there's a lot of stories to tell with that. Then the second shift, I'm doing it again. And I did have, in that first 10 hours, I had a little mini vision, my first little taste of revelation knowledge. And there's a long story that goes with it. But here I am in this second shift. And I, re if I remember right, I'm like five or six hours into it, and I haven't. <laughs> what what you want, you know, is to the heaven. While you're praying, you want the heavens to open and and liquid sunshine pour down, as Dave would say, and maybe feel the brush of of an angel's wing and hear Gabriel's trumpet. <laughs> you don't want to hear the voice of God. And I mean, it's nothing. It, I haven't heard nothing. I haven't seen nothing. I haven't had a goosebump. I haven't had a thing. Hours are going by, and I'm Shonda, I bought a Makedi, I'm daughter, just praying and praying and praying. And I asked the Lord, I asked the Lord, and, and I, I think I, if I remember correctly, I said something about along this line. I said, Lord, I know you don't have to answer this, but I've been praying a long time, Lord, because I thought it was a long time then. I had no idea what was ahead of me. But anyway, I said, I've been praying for hours, and I haven't heard anything, I haven't seen anything. I'm just praying because that's what Pastor Dave said. He said, you were doing things while I'm praying. And I know you don't have to answer this, but can I just ask you, during this time that I've been praying today, what have you been doing? And instantly, I know I, I didn't have time to even think this up. Instantly, as clear as you're hearing my voice, I heard him say, I'm driving the money changers from the temple. And I instantly remembered this story that we just read there in Matthew. I'm driving the money changers from the temple. Of course, I remembered verses from all those years in church. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You are the temple of God. And I knew I'd had a money problem. I, I'd loved money. The type and shadow is perfect. In, in Matthew, he drove the money changers out of the temple. And only then, only then, did they come to Jesus in the temple so they could be healed. And I, I, I understood, don't stop praying the mystery, son. I'm driving the money changers. I'm driving the things of this world out of you so that Christ can take his rightful place in the temple. And when he's able to do that, the people will come. And he will still heal them in the temple. Don't stop praying the mysteries. Jesus healed them all then. He'll heal them all now. Don't get weary in well-doing. Don't quit. Press in harder than ever before. This revival is going to be wonderful. And you are going to be a part of it. We'll see you next time. Love you so much. Bye-bye.